Like I, yeah. I can recall in some of the early interviews we did with Stakem, I would shout out Twinja and reporters would just be like, what? What is like, there was just no like record. It was, it's just a hashtag basically that a bunch of users kind of used to, to connect with each other. And um, they were super cool. There's probably like about like a hundred of these people and they were all like really close and super engaged. I thought the Stakem account was hilarious and they just amplified everything. But it was hilarious too, because uh, I don't know, like maybe 30 or 40% of this group really didn't like the account. Like, or, or I should say they were wary of it because they, these were kind of, again, tangential to the weird Twitter community. So these are kind of um, anti-corporate, anti-capitalist style users. Um, so there is, for a lot of them, there's kind of an innate skepticism toward like anything brand related. Um, so there was a few, like several accounts that were kind of standoffish to what we were doing. And, uh, but the rest were like totally on board. So it became this like really funny situation where there was kind of like a tension in these communities that engaged and that kind of played into the dynamic of, of growing the account. And once it, it went viral for the first time at like the end of 2017, the beginning of 2018 for this, uh, verify Stakem campaign that we did, which was just like the brand wasn't verified, just kind of pushing like, why is Twitter not verifying Stakem? And we were tagging celebrities and just trying to like make this thing blow up and this was on the heels of at the time twitter was in kind of hot water for verifying like certain nazi accounts and stuff so it was kind of like topical and um when that i mean if you're not if you're if you're gonna verify nazis you might as well verify Stakem. what do you do i think all right i mean i just think as a snowball effect that's the perfect momentum to ride there it's amazing PR nightmare or pr yeah. pr on many levels in our case. you know i i I'm still to this day, and this is now seven years later since when you you took over. Um, I'm still amazed at what you were able to pull off, and I do think the core of it probably has to do with the fact that you weren't trying to be corporate, right? You weren't trying to achieve some long term brand campaign, you know, goalpost. It was just this brand nobody was really paying attention to. You got to play with it, and you got to be you. And it was almost in some ways like a secret identity. It feels like is that is that what it felt like to you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I yeah. mean, having the the sort of freedom to post the way I was posting, it was paramount to that account's success. I mean, it's it's weird looking back on it now, especially since then, looking at all the accounts that I've I've worked on and I've never I shouldn't say I've never, there's been two two brands I've worked with that I had a similar amount of freedom, but in, even in both those cases, there was there was still significantly more oversight than I than I had with Stakem. There was really virtually no oversight, again, because they treated this account kind of like background noise. And it got once it kind of became larger than than me, like once it became kind of larger than any of us anticipated, it had a life of its own. So then it really became, I don't want to say difficult, because it wasn't like the client was ever unhappy. But it was definitely a situation that like went around t the end of 2018, early 2019, um, we had started to have more conversations internally about like how to plan for certain things. Cause like after the first viral, um, commentary thread that we did about like millennial angst, that's how it got like titled in the media. That was the end of 2018. There was a bunch of write-ups and a bunch of people, like a bunch of press reaching out for interviews. And I remember that being again, not like controversial per se, but it was definitely a bit more like we're saying humanized than the previous like shit posty stuff. So the the team, especially like the folks at stake and there was just a little bit of like concern of like, okay, how are we going to field the message here? Because now we know, like the world kind of knows, or like, I shouldn't say the world, but like whoever the people online who are following this account, they know or they have a sense of that this is just like one guy running it and it doesn't feel like corporate campaigny. Um, but like, how do you control for that? You know, like if I'm getting an interview, like if I'm doing an interview with like the Atlantic or, or Washington Post or whatever, like I can't just say whatever I want. And up until that point, I had no press training or anything. So I, kind of, I remember the first interview was, I think it was 2017. I did, or maybe it was the end of or 2018. I did one with um, the Atlantic with this journalist. And yeah, you know, this dude was just doing his job. I, I, I've got a lot of journalist friends. I, I, I get the the gig and what it kind of entails for lines of questioning. But this guy kind of came after me under false pretenses. Like he kind of built a rapport with me in like a friendly way. And like we had this conversation and it felt very kind of open. And then 
the way he used my quotes um, for his story was not not like a hit piece necessarily, but like a very critical piece in a way that I was not like the brand was not prepared for. I was not prepared for. And I remember when that came out, that was like a big eye opener for me to be like, okay, shit, like I got to start thinking like more about like how to approach this stuff because like i said there's no real guard